Good afternoon, appraisers. Brian Reynolds. You're watching the Appraisal Report webinar brought to you, as always, by the very fine folks over at Appraiser eLearning. You need some education? Check us out at appraiserelearning.com. You'll be glad you did. We got a lot of new courses coming out, some new instructors as well, a lot happening. Please go ahead and hit the subscribe button right now. I saw we just got over 6,000, Jim, so that's good news. But uh, let's hit 7,000 now. So go ahead and hit the subscribe button. That'll keep you in the know. It'll let you also know if we have any uh, special edition broadcasts, which occasionally we do. So you want to check that out. These sessions are all recorded. So if you have to go inspect something or you can't see the entire broadcast this afternoon, uh, jump over to the YouTube channel, Appraiser eLearning, and you can watch the recorded session in its entirety. We're glad you're here. We welcome your comments, but we also invite your questions. So we got a special guest today. Jim's going to tell you all about it, but feel free to ask questions. Hard questions are okay. Just be civil, be kind, be polite, right? We can agree to disagree but don't call me a dummy and I won't call you a dummy. Fair enough. Mr. Jim Morrison, how's things in your world, my friend? Good to see oh, you. I'm doing great. We're really excited to have Mark join us today. But before we get into introducing him, we have a couple things coming up we want everyone to know about. Um, coming up in April, we have the AXE Conference the that's in uh, partnership with the NAA. That's Appraiser Conference and Trade Show. That's going to be out in Colorado. Uh, yeah. April 20th through the 23rd. So that's going to be a lot of, of excitement for everyone that joins wants to join us there. We also have i which is the um, Instructor Conference and Retreat. That's going to be in Nashville at the home of Appraisery Learning. Um, that'll be on June 3rd and 4th. For anyone that's interested in becoming an instructor, you want to be the next Brian Reynolds uh, or something. I don't know if we could get a next Brian Reynolds. <laughs> well, please, not two of us. <laughs> but if anyone's interested in that, you can go to Appraisery Learning and sign up there and check out more about there. And then, of course, we'll have Valuation Expo in Las Vegas. That's our big conference. We're so excited for that. That's going to be August 19th through the 21st in Caesars Palace. And Mark Calabria, who's our guest today, I'm going to bring him in. He's going to be speaking there with us. Uh, Mark is the senior advisor at the Cato Institute. He provides strategic input, input and direction on the federal economy and policymaking process. Um, he's the former director at the Federal Housing Finance Agency, which regulates and supervises Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the federal home loan banks. And he recently wrote the book, Shelter from the Storm, How a COVID Mortgage Meltdown Was Averted. Mark, thanks for joining us. God, Jim, it's such a pleasure to be here. Mark, so we're going we're gonna to dive right in. Uh, I, got, I got a lot of questions for you. Uh, we need some answers, right? We, the last couple of years have been pretty tough for the appraisal professionals out there. I mean, really tough. I know uh, a couple of my guys have taken you know, additional jobs to kind of weather the storm, if you will. And, uh, and so there's a lot of uncertainty. There's, a, there's been a lot of anger and frustration. And now I think most of us have gotten just more scared to death, you know, what's going to happen. So we're going to get all into that real, real quickly. But before we do, I'd like for my audience to know you a little bit better. So, so talk to us a little bit about your background, how you came to be the director of FHFA. And quite frankly, what is that? I may have some viewers that, that aren't familiar with the FHFA. So tell us a little bit about yourself and the FHFA, if you don't mind. Great, great question. Let me just start with the FHFA and then I'll you know, give you my history as it revolves around the agency. So the Federal Housing Finance Agency is a government regulator here in Washington, D.C. It's a safety and soundness regulator that regulates Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac and the federal home loan banks. Uh, it was created in 2008. I actually was on Capitol Hill working on the Senate Banking Committee then for, for Richard Shelby from Alabama at the time uh, and actually helped create the agency. So was one of the authors of the statute. And again, this was in the 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 Talmud of 2008 where, you know, we had Fannie and Freddie failing, we had banks failing, we had the mortgage market in a meltdown. And so this was one of the things that really came out of the 2008 crisis and was really tried to put Fannie and Freddie uh, on much more stable ground. Uh, and so that's what FHFA does. It does a lot of mission stuff. Um, it does a lot of stuff looking at Fannie and Freddie's impact on the housing market as well as the federal home loan banks. 
So uh, I was confirmed by the Senate in beginning of 2019 to take that job. Prior to that, I had spent two years at the White House as chief economist for Mike Pence, and I had worked on tax reform. So the 2017 Tax Act, if you got a tax cut in there, you know, you're welcome. That's what we were trying to achieve. I <laughs> uh, also worked on trade issues, USMCA. So worked on many of those issues as well as labor reform and banking reform. Kept very busy. Have been on and off at the Cato Institute. For those who aren't aware, we, we are a think tank. It's nonpartisan. It's nonprofit. Uh, we have what's generally kind of thought of as a libertarian view of the world, which is more freedom is better. Uh, I have off and on written for the Cato Institute on financial services issues, touching banks. Um, but, you know, anything writ large, we write on things like Bitcoin, we write on financial privacy, we write on real estate. Uh, as mentioned, I spent uh, quite a while on Capitol Hill, about eight years. Um, I also did a turn at HUD when Mel Martinez was secretary back in the Bush years, if anybody remembers Mel Martinez, at which point I ran the RESPA office for the, for those who've had to deal with the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act and did our oversight of that 20 years ago. Uh, and before that, I got my career actually right out of finishing my PhD. My first job was National Association of Home Builders. I did a time at Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies and also worked at the National Association of Realtors in the 90s. So, you know, started out my career around the industry. And interestingly enough, you know, I, I graduated, you know, some of us may remember that first jobless recovery of the early 90s that really was, you know, the post savings and loan. And one of the reasons I got a PhD, you know, was that aftermath of the savings and loan crisis with the job market, quite frankly, was not very good. I might have ended up doing something else. So in a way, uh, disruptions and, of course, firea and tradition, all those things that came out of that time as well. So it's fair to say, you know, where I'm sitting today really does go back to where we were in, say, 92, 93, really kind of yeah, set me on a path. That, that's pretty incredible. So I, I, I worked for a savings and loan for a little bit uh, before the savings and loan crisis. Right. And uh, and it's it's interesting if, if we go all the way back there and 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 I could talk to you all day, uh, starting with fiery and, and back in in 89. But I don't want to. Right. We got a lot to talk about and I want to I want to keep it more focused on 2024. But before we get to 2024, you mentioned um, the creation of FHFA. You mentioned 2008. And let's just let's just revisit that for a second. OK, talked about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac failing. You know, if we talk about when they kind of got in hot water, along with some other folks, uh, yeah. the New York Attorney General's office, right, had had some lawsuits going on. And um, let's face it, we had we had liar loans is what I call yeah. them. Right. We had stated. Tell me how much money you make and I'll I'll make you a loan. Well, based yeah. on that. And nobody's going to check. Uh, we had 125% loan to value. That's brilliant. We all know your house is worth a hundred, but we're going to give you $25,000 worth of bonus money. And everybody's like, great, sign me up. Right. Um, but the stated income was the one that just blew my mind. And, and granted, you know, there's good and bad in everything, right? There, there's, there's good and bad loan officers. There's good and bad doctors. There's good and bad police officers. And, there's good and bad appraisers, quite frankly, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so you had, you know, when you had the LO saying, Mark, just tell me you make $75,000 a year and we're going to, nobody's going to check. You know, to me, that that starts riding that predatory lending, right? That. that. So, Absolutely. so, you know, maybe let's start with, the, there were, you know, probably a dozen different contributors to, to, to 2008. You know, Fannie and Freddie were part of it. They certainly weren't all of it. You know, Wall Street banks like Lehman, uh, you know, they played their role. And certainly in that kind of bubble, and in my opinion, you know, the federal interest rate policy we saw after the dot-com bubble, the record low rates, you know, you, you probably remember what a crazy refinance year 2003 was. Uh, and so you had really just a number of ingredients that created the perfect storm for lots of bad behavior um, and which of, of which there was significant fraud on the income side. And again, many of these products may make sense in isolation. Obviously, lots of people are self-employed. Uh, it may be easier to just state income than try to like find all your documentation. Not everybody, you know, has a sort of W-2 style job. But part of the problem is just like 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. For, so, and just like, you know, pick a payment might make sense for somebody with up and down liquidity needs throughout the year. Part of the problem in the 2000s was you had some niche products that really meant were, that were meant for niche situations that became far more normalized. And, and again, those products, they invited fraud. You know, you certainly had a system where the loan originators might have just tried to, okay, well, it looks good enough and somebody else will buy it, whether it's Wall Street or Fannie and Freddie. And it's not my problem once it's off my off my table. And a lot of pressure on the appraisal industry. And again, as we kind of mentioned, a lot of things came out of Firea and, and, and there was a lot of focus in savings and loan crisis on the appraisal industry. And there was a lot of focus, you know, Andy Cuomo, who's uh, seems to be back and forth in the news pretty regularly for, for, for various reasons. But uh, so Cuomo had, you know, really kind of tried to force a, and this is how we got the appraisal management industry that came out of the 2008, was really a pressure to try to redo the appraisal industry because there were a lot of pressure on appraisers to kind of hit the right number. And, right. and, and so I don't think this is recognized is how important it is that you get the, the, not the right number as the, you know, realtor may see it, but the right number, um, you know, that actually matches the what value. Really, what it really work? Right. What's it really exactly. Not what exactly. So, so, so if, if any of the viewers want more on that, I, you know, one, get your book. <laughs> Number two, there's a, there's a movie called the big short, right? And if you haven't seen that, it would be interesting to you as an appraiser to watch that, but real quick before, and I'm, I've got a question coming, but where, can, where can someone get your book? Go ahead and tell the name of your book again and where someone could order it right now. It's, they want it's Shelter from the Storm, just like the old Bob Dylan tune, if you remember. Um, and you could get it, you know, Amazon, uh, you know, Barnes and Noble, or you can go to the Cato, C-A-T-O dot org website and there's links there. Uh, but again, anywhere you, you want to buy books, you can find my book. Uh, and I think you'll enjoy the read. Again, it really focuses on that COVID time, although it does give a lot of a little bit of history of how we got there. Um, and while it's not necessarily in my book, I think anybody in the appraisal industry take some time and learn about the savings and loan crisis because it did set it sets the per it sets the environment for so much of what we still have to deal with today. Yeah, I remember I did some consulting for the RTC, so that was that was a long time ago. But well, was well, right. living with the aftermath of a lot of that. It's my right, point, right? And, and and for those who aren't familiar with that, that's the Resolution Trust Corporation, and they it was an ad hoc governmental agency to basically clean up the savings and loan mess. Right. So here's here's my question. Um, you know, we talk about liar's loans. We talked about uh, 125 percent LTV, no doc. Uh, you know, all kinds of creative things. And and to your point, you know, stated income is a great thing for an appraiser, right? Because it's it's hard for us to get a loan. Any small business owner, it's a nightmare. So while yeah. while the, the concept might have been good, there was abuse, right? There was abuse in that system and made it not such a great thing. The rating agencies kind of changed some ratings and we stacked some really bad loans in with a handful of good loans and got those sold. And it all comes crashing down. Right. Um, uh, we had uh, the HVCC. And then, you know, when that was about to sunset, boom, we get the Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, commonly known as Dodd-Frank. Here's here's my question. <laughs> Sorry, it took so long. <laughs> I knew there was one there. Now with appraisal waivers, which appraisers don't like, and I, I, I don't like them either. But I don't like them either. I'm not a fan and, either. As a consumer, I might like it okay, but as an appraiser, I hate them, right? So with appraisal waivers, with hybrid appraisals, with no appraisal, right? All the things we're dealing with today in 2024 now, could that be a catalyst for another housing crisis coming? And, and that's I mean, the short answer because the I think a lot of them are yes. The short answer is yes. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to be alarmist, um, but there are definitely you know cracks in the foundation of the system. And, and one of the reasons why I think it's useful for for people to know the history, you know, is you know prior to the savings and loan crisis, you know, the model was really a lender made the mortgage more often than not, kept it on their books. And they hired the appraiser to make sure that, you know, the value was there to protect themselves. 
And then, you know, Fannie and Freddie really were rounding errors before the savings and loan crisis. Their market shares were really single digits. I mean, I know it's hard to think about that today when they dominate the market. And they arose out of the savings and loan crisis. And so post savings and loan crisis, you had this massive growth in Fannie and Freddie, as well as private label securitization. And when you severed this, and so we moved to a world where the lender was really just an originator who had no skin in the game, really. Maybe they got repurchased obligations and such, sure. But by and large, they weren't going to hold the mortgage. And it got passed on to some distant investor. And then, as you mentioned, the rating agencies, Moody, Standard & Poor's, these folks would come in and, and put a grade on it. And so you kind of severed the close connection between the ultimate investor and the appraiser. And, and you kind of er eroded some of those incentives. I'll tell you, um, unfortunately, in Washington, if you talk to Fannie and Freddie, you talk to FHA, you talk to FHFA, and you talk to the, the stakeholders, they mostly look at the appraiser you know, is a compliance exercise. Oh, well, we got to check this box. And certainly I was um, quite frankly shocked to the degree of when I first as FHA director sat across the table, particularly from Freddie, but even at Fannie, where their view was, you know, the appraiser, it's just a, it's just a, a, a friction, a bump in the road that we're going to smooth out over time. And, and we've got our own data. And, and, and again, I'll say as an aside, you know, I have a PhD in economics. I've, I've done hedonic regressions. I know how to build an AVM. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a Luddite. So, and they're good quality checks, but they're not a substitute. And, and you know, the, it is also a garbage in, garbage out. You're only going to be as good as the data that are collected. And so I was definitely a little thrown off when I first got this to the degree to which these companies were um, transparent with me where they wanted to go. And I discuss in the book, we did expand the use of appraisal waivers during the crisis and COVID, but we did it to, you know, pr protect appraisers and homeowners so that at a point when, you know, we thought you were supposed to do social distancing, we thought nobody wanted to go anybody's house. So it really was meant as a public health measure in 2020. It was never meant to be permanent. And we also offset that. So all the additional appraisal waiver flexibility we gave in 2020, we lowered allowable LTVs, for instance. So we said, if you're going to use these things, you're not going to use them for cash outs and you're not going to use them for 95 LTV. You're going to use them in a responsible manner. And we're still going to expect an appraiser to drive by the house, you know, and collect some information. But we understood, you know, again, we know a lot more about COVID today than we knew you know, you know, it, it, four years ago. And so, you know, there, but these flexibilities were never meant to be permanent. And so I, I am worried about the direction. And part of it is there really is this mindset uh, that it's just a compliance exercise and that we need to get around that. You know, when we, when we talk about using these products other than an appraiser, Right, visiting a property, developing their opinion, and I, 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 I have mixed feelings. I, I think, you know, I do appraisals sometimes where I never see the property. Uh, sure. I have I do appraisals sometimes where the property doesn't exist. <laughs> you know, how can I see it when it's not there anymore? The fire burned it to the ground, but yet I'm still opining as to what the property was worth the day before the fire burned it to the ground. Right, so I understand those, um, but but when we talk about you know the the foreclosures and the default the shadow inventory with yeah. you if you will and so I, I did a podcast on shadow inventory and for those of you not familiar with that term it's 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 the loans that are pending foreclosure or it's loans that have went in delinquency and became current and have an expectation to go back in the delinquency right it's it's all of that so talk about shadow inventory is it up is it is it similar to 2008 is it not i mean the Where numbers are different. The numbers are the numbers are different but it's very real so let's let's start with maybe the the most dramatic aspect of it you know so my my back of the envelope is we probably have about 350,000 in the neighborhood um loans where the borrower has not made a payment since before covid so that's that's a that's long a time that's a lot. Um, and, and, and granted, about half of that, you know, when COVID hit, we, you know, there were about 200,000 Fannie Freddie borrowers that were in basically near foreclosure. You know, they hadn't typically hadn't paid in 18, 20 months. You know, and these were 
you know, maybe some of them would cure. But from our perspective, we press pause because, again, a pandemic hit. But the intention was always to try to get them back on their feet and resolve the process to some degree. So that's pre-COVID. Now, we probably have, you know, another 200,000 where, you know, they've had some difficulty because of COVID or they had some difficulty because of changes in the job market where there's a been a bit of extended pretend. And this is a bit of a philosophical difference. There certainly is a perspective within um, Washington, foremost probably at CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, where they kind of believe that any foreclosure is a bad thing. And, you know, my perspective is, of course, every foreclosure is a tragedy for the family involved. But if you're never allowed to have foreclosures or you drag them out where they take two to three years, you know, that's a bad thing for the market. You create all this overhang you don't revolve, resolve the situation where you're trying to, you know, you can help somebody get back on their feet. You know, you met, as we talked to savings and loan crisis a couple of times, cash for keys. You know, it's not like you have to just be uncompassionate. There are compassionate ways. And again, that's one of the topics of my book is the choice isn't like, you know, throw tons of money at it and bail everybody out or do nothing. The choice is a middle ground where you can be reasonable, you can help people, but you can help them transition to where they need to be, not the unsustainable situation they may be in. So I do think that, you know, probably half a million, maybe 600, and you are getting close to numbers. There's considerably higher. I would have said, you know, without having looked at the numbers recently, 2010, 11, we probably had about a million in shadow inventory. Um, And again, these are products that you know, that, that just take forever to get on the market. Um, it ends up, you will, once these things start to do get on the market, they'll depress prices. So, you know, we don't see any real distressed sales entering the market today. Um, and I think that that's a, a sign that you may have some of these things coming if the job market continues to soften. I should really have, a lot of this is going to depend on how the labor market does. You know, you, we lost... You know, you think about it, um, 2008 to probably 2010, 2011, we lost like nine, eight, nine million jobs. Of course, uh, in 2020, we lost uh, 22 million, but they came back pretty quickly. And it's always to keep in mind that uh, job stress, income stress really is the biggest predictor of default and and whether the family can make it through. Um, And so if you want to know whether we're going to start seeing distressed properties come on the market and put downward pressure on prices, keep keep your first, keep one eye on the labor market and then keep the other eye on what's going on with forbearances and and delinquencies. And I would start say FHA is, is really the canary in the coal mine because of course, you know, high LTV, high DTI, low FICO, the typical FHA borrower will have trouble before the conventional market. So, you know, you really want to know where the market is headed. Look at FHA and then the rest of the market's probably about nine to 12 months behind it. Yeah. You know, we, we, to your point, I don't think we, we don't have as many as the bad products that we did, you know, in, in 08, 09. And, and back before it was the it was the adjustable rates where there were no ceilings or, or no caps. You know, you could go, you could go from back then eight nine percent to fourteen percent the next year. People got payment shock, right? So we don't have we don't now you have annual caps and you have a ceiling and you know there's protection there to to prevent that payment shock, if you will. Uh, we don't have the liar loans. I don't think we have those today. Well, we you know, I mean, I do think. You know, so, uh, first, let me say, you know, because of Dodd Frank and other practices, we did get rid of some of the worst features. But hey, let's also remember, um, like you know, FHA is a good example. You can get up to a fifty-seven debt to income on an yeah. FHA loan, and in fact, the yeah. median, the typical FHA loan, is probably forty-five, forty-six. And so if you've got somebody where their DTI is over 50 and you're talking somebody who may be a 680, 700 FICO with loose attachment to the labor market, if something goes sideways for that person, that loan's going to have got to have problems. And so, well, but, and it's the American dream. Everybody wants a house. We want everybody to have a house. But here's the thing, you know, back, back my grandparents, my parents, you had to have money to buy a house. You know, it was like, you know, you know you got this case it may, may surprise you, you know, and you, you know, I'm a little bit of a history buff. I like to go back and look not just at the, you know, the, the trends, but also the data. So before 1960, the majority of homeowners in America, 
the majority own their homes free and clear, no mortgage at all. I mean, wow. that's ownership. Wow. <laughs> you know, granted, wow. we've, we've well, made a lot of changes in that time. The, the point I'm trying to make with that is, is that if you if you took 10 years to save a down payment, right, and you you hit hard times, boy, you're going to figure it out to keep that home. You are often if you have, you know, if you have practically no no down payment and you hit hard times. I mean, we had a builder here back in those days, Mark, a dollar down, a dollar down and your good credit got you in the house. Well, next year, if you get laid off, you're just we've been paying rent for a year. Let's walk. Right. And so my point with all of this is at least my office and some of the, some of the other appraisers out there I talk to, they're doing more foreclosure appraisal work. Now yeah. they're doing more, you know, uh, pending foreclosure default services. I know we're getting requests for a lot of drive by appraisals and you can't contact the owner because it's a pending foreclosure. <laughs> and that's why I asked the question, you know, uh, is another house, you know, it's inevitable. We're going to have another housing crisis. I guess the question is when, right? When is yeah. that going to occur? And I think the big difference is we have still such strong de demand for housing. We, you we know, do. we have a scarcity of inventory, so maybe it's going to be a little bit, huh? So let me go through a couple of those those points, and I'll start with you know I'm I'm definitely a guy who thinks housing markets go up and down. It's still a cyclical mm -hmm. industry. Uh, I don't think that has really changed. I'm not going to pretend to be able to call it the top, although you know I, I think we're probably closer to the top um, than not. I think a common perception, and if I can kind of devolve into a little econ 101 for a second. If you think about the kind of like markets you may have in California where supply is very constrained, you know, we basically say supply is inelastic there. Where Econ 101 teaches us that the more inelastic supply is in a market, the bigger changes in price you'll get for the same changes in demand. And so what that really implies is that if you see job loss, if you see income declines, and you see a pullback in demand, even with tight supply, you'll get actually pretty large price declines. And you see that if you look across states and differences building. So I often kind of hear a common narrative that, well, prices can't go down because supply is constrained. Well, that's not really true. That's not necessarily how the market works. Of course, they're not going to fall to zero. Um, right. you, know, you know, San Francisco is not Buffalo, New York. So there's, you know, they're not going to be giving away homes in, anytime soon unless they don't do anything crime about, about crime in San Francisco. But that's a different issue. So all, the, all that said, um, and I, I will also add, yes, we got rid of some of the worst product features, but, you know, you've got probably higher DTIs than we've ever had. Um, and it's not you know, the problem with like DTA, LTV and FICO. It's not like any one of them is a problem. It's when you combine them. So you go back to your buddy with a very low down payment, one, one, one percent down, let's say. Well, you know, if that person has an 800 FICO, they're, they're going to pay e even when they're underwater. Now, if you put 1% down and they have a 720, maybe you'll have a little bit more trouble. If they have a 680 or less, then, then you're definitely going to run into a bumps. Yeah. So the problem is combining all of these things in a way that doesn't leave any cushion. And, and I really do worry that we may be going through that again. And I think credit quality also know we, there were things we did post Dodd Frank, but there was also things we did during the pandemic that resulted in what I call FICO inflation. So you keep in mind, for instance, all throughout 2020, when we were running Fannie and Freddie, were we reporting those forbearances delinquencies? No, those didn't end up in anybody's credit bureau. And so we went through, you know, two or three years where adverse credit events, and again, keep in mind all this time we were had freezes on student loans too in Washington. So all sorts of adverse credit events that normally would get reported to credit agencies during the pandemic were not. And it results in FICO inflation. So I haven't seen anybody really quantify it in a right way, but I've talked to a lot of people in the industry on the credit side. And my back of the envelope is that, you know, compared to say 2005, FICO scores are probably about 25 points higher than they would be. And so, wow. should, so, so the, the credit scores are not credible right now is what you're saying. <laughs> they're inflated. They're, they're inflated. And again, it's, it's actually more inflation the lower down you are. I mean, somebody who's probably an 800 was going to be an 800 anyhow. But, you know, somebody who's a, who comes in today at 740 is probably actually going to perform more like a 715, 720.
Wow, that's interesting. Don't go anywhere. Uh, Jim, uh, we're at the halfway mark. I cannot <laughs> believe it. So a couple of questions uh, uh, for you, Mr. Jim Morrison. Do we have any questions coming in? And then I know you need to take care of some business and, uh, and give a word to our sponsor. We do. And I don't know if you can see this one. Um, this person said, are the waivers the opposite side of the coin for the stated income loans? Are stated value loans with waivers the new thing? I, I think it's a element of it uh, of the market that is concerning and becoming more uh, frequent. So it, it is it is a concern. I mean, and I like that. You know, I guess I like and don't like the stated value phrase. But I like it in that I think it does describe a lot of what's going on. I don't like it and unsettles me in the way that I think we should all be concerned. But I think it's an accurate description in some segment of the market. And, you know, for the most part, we really tried when I was at FHA to keep any appraisal waivers to loans in which, you know, there were significant equity. You know, we were, we, for instance, during 2020, we were lowering these things to, you know, you had to have like a 75, 80 LTV max. So we weren't doing these for year 95 and things like that where they're gonna be for, far more problematic. But there is a real push now, and part of this is related to the PAVE efforts, of course, you know, as you've mentioned at the, at the top of the hour, if you will, I mean, not only do you have a down market, which I think is going to get better, and I know we'll talk about this a little bit, I think 2024 right. is going to be a little better, but you've had such kind of public policy scrutiny and pressure um, that it's, you know, not you know, not only do you have a much as much business, but what business you have is far more painful than than it was in the past. Yeah. And some yeah. of that, I think, will will moderate. But this is a real problem. I don't think in my entire career, Mark, I've I've ever heard a president of the United States of America refer to appraiser and appraisal and not in a favorable manner, my might add. So yeah. it, it's, it's, it's reached the highest level of office to your point with PAVE and whatnot. Jim, uh, Jim, you want to give a shout out to our sponsor real quick before the time gets away from us? Yeah, absolutely. We do want to thank LIA for sponsoring this webinar and, and helping bring it to all of our uh, people watching. LIA Administrators and Insurance Services provides E&O insurance with a commitment to superior customer service, outstanding liability education, and unmatched claim defense. Our professional liability program benefits 10,000 real estate professionals nationwide. Explore our appraiser liability education by Peter Christensen and cost-effective seminars created exclusively for valuation professionals. Our underwriters, each with an average of 26 years of experience, are dedicated to supporting appraisers, Visit liability.com, that's L-I-A-B-I-L-I-T-Y.com to discover how LIA can safeguard your business. Thank you, Bring Jim. Thanks, Jim. And we're going we're gonna to get to, you know, if anybody else has any additional questions uh, in just a moment. But Mark, I want to I shift gears here a little bit. I just saw, um, I just saw something recently. Uh, this was January 26th. It says mortgage rates will fall below 6%. Yeah, baby, we're ready for, <laughs> we're, everybody who's watching is ready for that, I tell you. So mortgage rates will fall below 6% in 2024 and the U.S. economy will avoid a recession, Fannie Mae says. And so uh, Jim Morrison's gonna put this link in the chat if anybody watching wants to read that or you can actually listen to it the way I did. Uh, what do you think, Mark? Are the rates going to fall below six percent? So let me let me parse that out, and I'll preface, you know, with I mean, Doug Duncan, you know, a good friend of mine who's chief economist at Fannie, and you know, you see a range of um, estimates in the market and forecasts, and I do think that the Fannie team tries to call it right down the middle. So I actually, you know, I might have some other knocks on the company, but the econ team really tries to give you what they think they're going to see. And so I would parse out, you know, get down to below six is different than, say, that the, where they may average throughout the year. So I do think that there will be moments in 2024 where we will see rates below six. I think the norm, the, you know, the typical average, what you should expect most of the year will probably be closer to six and a half. Um, but yeah, there'll be there'll pro there'll be days when you know five point eight, but I don't think that's going to be what you're going to see most of the year. So maybe maybe slightly um, less optimistic, but but that's not out of the ballpark. You know, when I when I got in this business I, is in the late 
eighties, you know, the rates were 18%. Yeah, yeah no, it's, uh, <laughs> and, we've seen pretty uh, crazy rates in the past. I think they bottomed out at about 10% and, and maybe, maybe a, an adjustable rate or something at nine and a half, you know, nine and a quarter. Yeah. But, but everybody thought 10% for, for a 30 year conventional loan was great. And, and listen, I want 3% just like everybody else does. Well, we're not going to get, you know, that's, that's what people we're need not to going do. back there. What, right. We're not going back there. People need to get over that. I mean, 6% is yeah. a great rate. And really, historically speaking, seven and eight is a pretty good rate for yeah, long term. I mean, yeah, my, my first mortgage was over nine. So, and, 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 and I certainly, so, I mean, let's start. We're not going to get back to, to sub four, at least not anytime soon. Right. You know, we, we, we will dance around in the in the upper fives, lower sixes. And I think, you know, one, consumers are getting, you know, more used to that. Uh, you know, I think that people were still, I think people for a while still thought, oh, my neighbor's got, you know, three and a half. I want three and a half. You know, people need, it takes people a little while to adjust psychologically to it. So I think we're getting there with that part. Uh, and I also think, you know, you just have life events, whether it's, you know, divorces or job moves and the things that kind of, you know, our retirement where so many of these houses were start to come on the market. I mean, yes, a number, a, a significant percentage will keep their 3% and rent the property and buy somewhere else, but not everybody has that option. So, yeah. uh, you know, most of them, most of those will be sales. So I expect the existing home sales to be, I mean, Keep in mind, I mean, 2023 was just brutal in terms of existing home sales. So, so okay. I, you know, so, I, but so on one hand, you know, it's, I don't know if you consider it good or bad news if I say, I think the existing home sales will probably be 10 to 15% better um, in 2024. But granted, that's still historically low. But I think we're hitting, I think we've hit bottom in terms of existing home sales numbers. Now, now they say, you know, the Fed and their decisions are, are not political. Uh, is there politics involved with what the Fed does with the rate? Yes or no? I mean, yes is the short answer, but I think it sometimes works differently than than you might than the general public might presume. So you know, they are concerned about perceptions. So I know there are commentators out there that are telling you they're going to be like six rate cuts in twenty twenty four. I don't, I don't see it. That would be perceived as just too aggressive in election year. Now, of course, it's going to depend on what the greater economy looks like. The only way we're going to get six rate cuts is if you see the job market fall off a cliff. Uh, otherwise, we're not. You know, if if the job market continues to cool like it's been doing, but numbers continue to be positive so that we are seeing job growth, we're just not seeing the same sort of job growth. I think maybe we would get three rate cuts this year, but it, it's going to take a, a bad economy to get more than that, in my opinion. So really, the politics tends to play in that the Fed tends to moderate their moves in an election year, but the moves do tend to be where you think they would be. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. I, and, and I don't I don't want to really get sure. deep into politics here, <laughs> but but this is, like we said, an election year. What uh, what's going to happen? Let's let's just say with Fannie and Freddie, if there's an administrative change, if there's if we have someone new in the White House come next January, what what happens with Fannie and Freddie? What happens to the FHFA? Uh, some of those things. Great question. I do want to make an addendum to my to the to the rate question before we get into this. Declines in mortgage rates are not simply going to be because the Fed lowers rates. A big part of the historic spread between treasuries and mortgages is because of prepayment risk. So if someone makes you a seven or eight percent mortgage, they're going to assume it's going to prepay. And as you rates start to get more normalized, that prepayment, that prepayment risk premium shrinks. So part of the decline in rates is going to be because of the decline in prepayment risk. And that's a big part of this. So getting back to, you know, you know, it, what what is the election year hold? So let's make the easier, you know, start with if there's a change in administrations. So uh, keep in mind, FHFA, as well as CFPB, um, are no longer independent regulators. So the directors of CFPB and FHFA gone day one, inauguration day. Uh, and you'll see acting directors put in place in attempts to get people in place. Now, I think a, a, a very big difference, and those who followed my time at FHFA know that 
we were prioritizing, as I believe the law required us to do, to get Fannie and Freddie out of conservatorship. And I think that will be a high priority for a Republican administration. Um, having done a lot of work, and I would go as far to say, you know, if it wasn't for COVID, they would be out of conservatorship now. That's really what threw us yeah, threw us know. off our path, as was true for so many of us in our lives. You know, the pandemic kind of took over a lot of things. So I, I think I feel comfortable saying um, it's doable in a four-year term. Now, it's not doable in six months because there's a tremendous amount of work that needs to be put into it. Uh, and I think there will need to be external equity raises. But I could see a Fannie Freddie exit in, you know, probably 2027, you know, is probably where I would target it if there's a Republican administration. Now, second term of Biden, there's been very little interest shown from from Treasury or the White House in doing an exit. Uh, So that's not going to happen this year. Maybe that changes next year uh, where the dynamic may shift to, you know, should we get them out? Should we kind of start to monetize the, ca- the taxpayer investment and, and try to use it for something else? Uh, I think a lot of it will depend on whether there's a change in leadership at Treasury. Uh, Secretary Yellen has shown no interest really in having an exit from conservatorship. I don't know that I see any evidence that that would change. And they don't, they aren't really staffed, you know, so there was often talk about Treasury bringing in personnel. You haven't seen that. So watch out for personnel changes. I think that the the Biden folks have seen uh, useful to have Fiani and Freddie conservatorship for their own public policy purposes. So they're a lot less likely. So maybe to put some numbers on it, uh, if there's a Republican administration, I give it, you know, 80 percent chance that within that four year term, Fiani and Freddie out of conservatorship. If there's a second term of Biden, you know, maybe I give it a 30 percent chance at best that there's an exit from conservatorship in that four year window. And, and what does that mean? I mean, what does that mean for Fannie, for Freddie and and appraisers uh, when when they get out of that? Right. They're not regulated anymore. Like well, they they're are still now. regulated, but they're not really kind of micromanaged in the same way. And, you know, they themselves will be more risk averse. So uh, some of the stuff, it's it's easy to say. I, I think that um, the credit box will modestly tighten. They're definitely being told via the conservator to take more risk than they as companies would choose to take. Now, again, this would be modest, barely noticeable, certainly not enough to have an impact on the overall market, but enough to kind of maybe improve the quality of their book. Um, you know, I don't think, you know, if there's a second Biden term, even if they exit, you're not going to see things like PAVE go away. But, you know, if they're out of conservatorship, um, there'll be a little less attention to maybe more hot button political issues um, like PAVE, uh, like some of the housing equity plans. Certainly, if they're released from conservatorship, you know, in a Republican administration, you know, you could pretty much expect kind of PAVE to be wound down. Um with some modest changes, you know, again, there's the, you know, people so want to be an administrative to- change. You, you predict that the pave, the task force would, would dissolve. Is that what I'm yeah, hearing? I think, I think it would probably resolve under Republican administration. I should note, you know, we did a request for input on appraisal issues when I was there. We asked in that long list of questions, stuff like appraisal bias. Um, and so you would certainly see some modifications but using this as an ongoing, you know, kind of political issue rather than trying to kind of address underlying issues in the mortgage market, I think I think would decline. I think again, I would expect pay to be wound up in a in a Republican administration. I think you'd see much more attention on trying to get you know more appraisal independence in place, not just at the GSEs but also at FHA. Uh, so I think from in that point of view, you may see these issues that the politics around these issues lowered a little bit, the temperature taken down a bit. Um, again, you know, you certainly would see Tr- Fannie and Freddie, you know, maybe more cost cutting. You know, again, tr- maybe they would even raise some fees here and there. I mean, you t- maybe at the bottom line, I think about it, you'd see them act in a more commercial manner. <laughs> which, which is so, not necessarily so when, a bad thing. When you say tighten up a little bit, does that mean they're going to maybe, maybe be very conservative on the number of appraisal waivers that they do? Or yeah, you know, like you, yeah, like you, you would see some changes there. Um, I mean, I, you would also see a bigger divergence. 
you know, on one hand, one of the things that truly kind of surprised me a lot, you know, um, you know, it, it, when I was FHMA director, I would often ask Fannie and Freddie for feedback on issues. And it's shocking how different, how often you'd get dramatically different answers from both of them. And, and again, they have, they do have slightly different business models in some fa facets. And even on the appraisal waiver stuff, and initially Freddie was far more aggressive. So for instance, but there's been a lot of focus, particularly with this administration, but uh, are, are honestly throughout the conservatorship on having greater alignment, on having Fannie and Freddie do things the same way. Now, when they're out of conservatorship, I mean, A, they're not, they're not outside of the antitrust laws, so their ability to coordinate on issues right. actually becomes questionable legally. But as importantly, you know, they do think of themselves as having different niches and different comparative advantages. And, and so in some sense, I could see, you know, maybe Freddie continues to be aggressive on appraisal waivers, maybe Fannie changes course. But I think you would see these companies behave, you know, the, the divergence in, in behavior would reassert itself that you saw sort of pre-conservatorship. Again, there are different cultures and there are different business approaches at both companies. And again, that's kind of masked by the conservatorship, which is forces a high degree of uniformity than it would happen otherwise. Yeah, yeah. So administrative change, uh, that goes away in a year or so. Current administration, probably another three, four years or longer. That's your prediction. Yeah, but but again, you know, I think there's a high, I mean, the, the Biden, second term Biden would largely be a status quo. I mean, with a small, small chance of, of, of significant change. Um, you know, and again, a, a lot of this is contingent too. If we do see significant downturn in the housing market, then, you know, that scrambles the egg in a lot of ways that makes it hard to predict, um, especially if Fannie and Freddie find themselves significantly stressed. I guess I put it this way, even you know, if you have significant stress in the housing market with, you know, higher delinquencies, job losses, then even under Republican administration, the odds of an exit greatly decline. I mean, Washington will look at Fannie and Freddie as leverage for public policy and want to keep their hands on the reins, if you will. You know, I, I know you you have a lot of insight, Fannie, Freddie, and and just you're you're a pretty knowledgeable guy. You know, a, a little intimidating, I might might add. <laughs> no uh, reason for that. But 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 let me ask you about just banks, okay? Um, banks can make loans without an appraisal, right? They can right. they can get an evaluation, um, or many times if there's a, a de minimis, right? They don't they don't even, need an, you know, they can get a real estate agent to say, Hey, just give me an idea. Right. Um, I'll give you an example. I, I've remodeled a couple of houses the last couple of years. Um, I mean, I bought one at a, at a foreclosure sale and to your point about folks in that my heart goes out, you know, I, I, I've been at the top of the mountain. I've been at the bottom of the mountain <laughs> more than once. Uh, so, you know, the, that young lady asked for additional time and without hesitation, take, take whatever time you need. Right. Um, the one that we, we really put a lot of money into and remodeled, they were just going to do, um, uh, a drive by. And I said, no, 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 <laughs> no. I mean, if I put a lot of money in this house. I, I don't want them to look at the MLS or whatever. It's a different house from where I bought it, right? It's important. Right. Well, Brian, it cost you money. I don't care. I, I'm willing to pay a $600 appraisal fee. I want a certified appraiser coming in this house and developing an opinion rather than somebody driving by the outside. It's a different house. Now, now the granted, the foreclosure when I bought, uh, I hadn't even been in it and they just had a real estate agent give an eval. Okay. Um, give me, give me some insight. I think part of the problem that we as appraisers, I, part of the problem we have as appraisers is, you know, this is, this is the biggest asset most individuals will have in their lifetime. Right. Why, why are you risking that? Right. Why would you not a friend of mine, Jeff Bradford uh, says, you know, in his opinion, all valuations should be done by appraisers. I like that. I like that a lot, yeah. right? So why is it okay you can have a non-appraiser in some of these instances uh, provide yeah, you, the, that you information? You really kind of, to, to me, touched on a core um, element of the debate and, and, and where I think that why, you know, the really what the flaw is in the current system. 
So for the most part, I mean, again, look at the examples you talked about, or actually you look in the non-real estate space where, you know, you may, you know, I, I like books, I'm too cheap to buy really old ones, but obviously people go to auctions and bid on, you know, old books and often will, you know, bring their appraisal and get, get someone to do a valuation of how much is this worth. And we see that. And of course, you know, I grew up on a farm, you know, you go to the livestock market and someone's going to do an appraisal of what that cow's worth. And so there's a whole number of markets where there's a evaluation system bid up. And almost all those other markets, there's usually somebody independently working for the buyer. And in your instance, where you talked about the improvements you did to the property, you really saw it from the owner. You know, it benefits me as a consumer to have an appraiser. And the problem in the real estate space is it's it's got such a convoluted regulatory structure that a the conversation does not focus on the value to the buy, to the buyer. And in fact, whenever it does, you see these pave style conversations where the argument is that. Oh, but it's being undervalued. You know, when again, go back to the savings loan crisis, go back to 2008. The problem for the consumer is more often than not that the property is overvalued. But if you're looking at this as much as Washington does as an access issue rather than a sustainability and rather than actually protecting rather than a consumer protection issue, you, you get a different set of values. So, A, I think the industry needs to find a way to message itself as a value directly to the consumer because again most people approach this as oh i've got to get an appraisal and they look at it as a compliance exercise so how do we change that conversation and i think until you do i think you're going to be in this box where people try to like oh it's compliance and i like to minimize compliance you know what is the value add and of course some of this is the history where the appraiser really came out of a you know lender making a loan and holding it and wanting to protect themselves. It didn't start out as a way really to protect the borrower. And so I do think that the future of the industry really depends on being able to sell itself as a plus for, for buyers, for consumers directly. Um, and I, to be frank, I, that's just not the way it's viewed in Washington today. And, and so how do, you, how do you flip that script, if you will? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess... I guess I look at it not necessarily from compliance, as you stated, but more from from it's it's the collateral <laughs> that yeah. that is securing that loan, right? So to oh yeah, to, so you and I, you and I agree on that, but you know the, the view in Washington is kind of well, you know FHA, Fannie and Freddie. If everything goes sideways, the taxpayer will just write a big check, and you know if the if the home's not worth it, well, you know we won't foreclose, and the and the the person can stay there forever indefinitely. That's the CFPB perspective. So there is kind of a view that it's like. I mean, you know, I really tried to put an emphasis when I was at FHFA, and I appreciate that the administration sometimes uses my language about sustainable home ownership, but there's a difference between just home ownership and sustainable home ownership. And, and to me, the objective has to be, can you get somebody into a situation where they stay and they build wealth? And at the end of the day, that's just, you know, my, I would argue that the Washington mortgage finance infrastructure is much more obsessively narrowly focused on access, just getting people into homes without really thinking about whether it's a sustainable long term situation for the for the for that person, for the market, for the taxpayer. Um, and that's why I think that, you know, they look at it as a complete appliance exercise. I don't, but and, and you don't, but I think Macho Washington does because they look at it as, well, we want to get this person in the house. And if the doesn't if you don't hit the number, then we, we can't close the sale. Right. Which of course right. at the end of the day, if you don't hit the number, then perhaps the seller should bring the number down. <laughs> There's right. other right. avenues that actually you're better for consumers. But there is just such a single minded focus on access that really distorts all the other thinking on these topics in Washington. Yeah, yeah, that's frustration. So, so to summarize, twenty twenty four going to be a good year for appraisers. A better year than twenty twenty three. Let's just say that. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. All right. And you and you're thinking, how many how many rate cuts? You know, I think we'll probably see three. Uh, at, at honestly, at most, with the caveat, if things get really bad, then yes, you'll see more. But uh, if they if they putter along like we're doing, you know, three rate cuts. But again, I want to emphasize that as rates start to narrow, the pre, the prepayment premium and that spread will decline as well. So, 
you can see 70 – let's say you see three rate cuts, 25 basis points, obviously 70 base, basis points. You could see that and you could still see rates go down by more like 100 or 125 or even 150. So it's not going to track the Fed one for one necessarily. Right, 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 right. And then you've got a lot of the folks that have bought during the last couple of years going to want to refinance during that period if those dip down and then that's going to bring out even more buyers, I would predict. So yeah. uh, so I, I hope you're right. I hope, I hope 2024 is at least better than 23. And I'm, I'm optimistic that it will be as well. Mark, thanks so much for being here. You're, you're a busy guy. I appreciate your time. Uh, if, if one of the viewers uh, would like to get in touch with you, maybe they want to engage you for a speaking uh, gig or something. What's the best way to get in touch with you? So if you go to the Cato website, that's C-A-T-O dot org, uh, you can find, you know, uh, uh, my bio there and there should be an email link that'll get you to me. So, um, you know, certainly feel free to reach out. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, you can find a link to my to my book there. I'd love to hear what people think about it. If you like it, you know, go to Amazon somewhere, write a review so other people can know what you think about it. Very cool. Very cool. Shelter from the storm. Check it out, folks. Uh, I'm going to get that. I'm not an avid reader. I wish to God I was, but I am going to get that. I was hoping to grab a grab a book while uh, I was at CRN and I, I missed out on that. So I'll be getting on Amazon and making my order as well. Uh, and I believe Jim said you're coming to Val Expo. You, you'll be presenting at Val Expo. I planning to be in Vegas, you know, maybe I'll get my opportunity to go to the, the sphere even and we can find out what all the, the hype is about. Nice, nice. Well, I'm going to tackle you and get you to autograph the book when I'd I see you. I'd be delighted to. I hope to see everybody uh, there in Vegas in August. Very, very good. Thank you, Mark, for being here. Jim? Well, Jim thank Moore. you all for joining us. Thanks so much, Mark and Brian. I thought that was such a great conversation. Um, I'm going to bring Brian back in and we'll sign off. Thanks, Jim. So the appraisal report webinar, we're glad you're here. We are back. Uh, typically, this is the fourth Thursday of every month at 10 o'clock uh, in the morning. We've massaged this one a little bit. And we do that, obviously, in November and December. But I think next month, uh, we're back on track, if I remember right. <laughs> uh, Jim, do you have the date uh, for, for next month? I, I know we talked about that. Yeah, I'm pulling up my calendar, but we yeah, caught him off guard. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to be back in February for the 22nd, which will be the fourth Thursday of the month. Very good. And I believe that is at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. So mark that on your calendar. Better yet, just hit the subscribe button and you'll know about it. Uh, my good friend Scott Cullen will be here. Uh, he's with the uh, Solomon Adjustment Calculator and he's made some uh, adjustments and uh, I think you'll be interested in to see what he's got uh, cooking over there at Solomon. So join us February 22nd at 10 o'clock Central Standard Time with Scott Cullen. Until next time, stay, stay very safe, make some money, take a little mini vacation if you, if you need one. I know I need one. I'm way past due. And until next time, happy appraising. Thanks again to LIA for helping us put this on.